medical picture of that. Okay. Ooh, she was done. Okay, hello and welcome to the Nevada State Fall 2022 Town Hall. It is magnificent to have you all here. Um, I don't have to tell you, it's been more than a minute since we've been able to come together in this type of space and um, couldn't be more happy to have you here with us today. Hope you enjoyed the reception out there. I am Amber Lopez Lassiter, Chief of Staff and Strategy here at the college. And as we go through, we will have our panelists introduce themselves individually. Also want to welcome the folks that are joining us virtually. Um, before we jump in, I do want to take a quick minute to thank everyone that made today happen. We have Amy Evaluna, our producer extraordinaire, Yes, 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 yes. Snaps and applause. We have the uh, exquisite marketing team. Yeah, we're doing the things. IT, catering, facilities. So though we don't technically have sports here yet, I will say producing these types of events is a team sport. So I want to thank everyone who put their back into it. Um, also want to thank those who submitted questions. We had over 40 and we plan to move through those um, during the first part of this segment and then we'll open it up to the audience for live questions. And then after that, we'll be transitioning to Dr. Edith Fernandez to host the governance panel. So we've got a great morning. Uh, as we navigate through this post um, epidemic world, we do encourage you to continue to be considerate and to make choices that are best for you when it comes to masking and to seating. So away we go. I'll have the panelists introduce themselves and you'll see the way that we categorized the questions was under the five pillars that Dr. Pollard worked on in her first year here. And happy first anniversary, Madam President. That's just C2, we're getting to two. So let's jump right in. So many of you may have heard about this little initiative that we've been working on um, regarding a name change of the institution. In fact, you may have seen, we've got a couple of great articles today, um, coverage in both the Sun and the RJ, but this has been an ongoing discussion um, well before the previous president, Bart Patterson, left and has intensified over this last year. I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Pollard, if you could answer specifically folks want to know what this type of change to the institution would mean to them. So how can can you tell us how becoming Nevada State University will help us define and amplify the teaching university in Nevada? Well, first of all, good morning, everyone. I'm hopeful that you can hear me. Um, you have the microphones here and I'm following direction. No, I'm not. Ah, there we go. Is that better? Yes. We're gonna move it closer to me. Move the move the goose closer to me. There we go. That better? All right. So good morning, everyone. Glad to be here and glad to see each of you. Danette, that did not count my time. Just making sure you know that. <laughs> so let me be very brief. One is I want to encourage you if you have not reviewed the materials that are listed within the Board of Regents packet for next week's meeting, where we elucidate all of the issues around the name change including the history of this, the data that has been looked at, and indeed uh, what we hope to be a profound statement as to why this is necessary. I would encourage you to do that. And as Dr. Amber mentioned, there are two great pieces that were just uh, uh, went out this morning from the RJ and the Sun. They really are a great synopsis of this. In short order, this was an examination the college began a number of years ago before I even arrived about talking about the value proposition and the branding positioning of Nevada State within the system of higher education here. And in fact, uh, I have tried to consolidate this down to two key issues. For me, it is an economic competitiveness issue and it is an equity issue. 
economic competitiveness, there is no place in the country where having too many colleges and universities is a bad thing. In fact, if you were to look at the data around an educated society, you see a profound statement around greater voter engagement, less dependence on health outcome, uh, better health outcomes, all the things that you all know, less crime, all the things that are relevant about living in an educated society. I would offer to you that Nevada ranks 46th in the country in terms of adults who've earned a college degree. I don't think the race to the bottom should continue to be our narrative in the state. And as a result of that, uh, the idea of talking about positioning Southern Nevada in particular and the state of Nevada as being a place where education is valued and seen is important. We've been functioning as a university for years. We are robust. We serve over 7,000 students. We have both undergraduate and graduate programming. We have robust su uh, support services for our students. And also, we have a value proposition in this community. 80% of our graduates live in this area, and they make a significant uh, impact. And therefore, if you hold with my proposition that we serve the new majority, the new majority is entitled to a name that's going to give them the value positioning in the broader marketplace. I had a student uh, have a conversation with me last year that really cemented my thinking on this. She's graduating from Nevada State or was with a bachelor's degree in nursing and she was interviewing with uh, hospitals and she was spending more time explaining to them that she was graduating with a BSN and not an ADN and why this was important, that she had a degree, a bachelor's degree from a university, as she wanted to say, but from a college, and wanted them to understand that value proposition. This was out of state. And I think it's important for us to understand that. So if we agree by the fact that over half of our students, 55% are first generation students, 75% are students of color, they live in this community, 20% of them are parenting adults, we want them to be economically viable. Yeah, I'm a little wound up about this, the caffeine is kicked in. Um, <laughs> if y'all knew some of the things I'm having to do to talk about this issue, y'all would be sending me uh, cocktails every five minutes. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that. But <laughs> the important part about this is that for us, for me, it is about the economic competitiveness of the state and region, and it's about the equity for our students. And let me also be saying for our employees. Someone asked me the other day, what are the benefits of this for our employees? We already have some of the best faculty and staff in the country teaching here. They deserve to have a name that rises up to meet them. University speaks to that. It also allows us to be able to talk about our value positioning within the broader NCHI system of higher education. And last but not least, and be very clear about this, I've said it 1,500 times, and I will say it 1,500 times more. This is a name change only. We're not changing our designation within the system of higher education. We will continue to be the tier two as it relates to higher education in the state. We are not a community college. We are not going to be an R1 as defined by the Carnegie system. But our role is critical to the vitality of this region and to embrace that and to talk about that. And then for us to figure out what it means to be a teaching university and how we then internalize that work is important. So that's my two cents and I'm going to simmer down now. I love it. Well, you're leading us brilliantly. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to ask both Stephanie and Tony to speak to questions we receive that align with our second pillar. Dr. Coleman, would you be so kind to go first and give us an update on the state of student affairs here on campus while weaving in answers to some of the specific questions we received that are back on the PowerPoint? Okay, so let me first uh, tell Lynette, get the, get the, tell Lynette, get the red one ready. Okay, um, so student affairs is new. Um, July 1, we launched the Student Affairs Division, and for a lot of people, they're not sure exactly what departments fall under Student Affairs. So we have the entire TRIO umbrella, and we are very proud to have that TRIO programming here, to have four distinct TRIO programs. That is a big deal. So that is Student Support Services, that's Upward Bound, that's Gear Up, and the new, yes, uh, Ronald McNair um, Scholar Program. Very happy, very happy for that program. Very excited to see what Dr. Kimberly Williams does with that program. And of course, Keisha uh, Hollingsworth is always putting forward, you know, just the best, best effort with uh, the student support program here at the college. Student Affairs also includes DRC, 
Career Services, which has a rebranding, refocus, new leadership approach to how they service our students who are, again, trying to transition from the classroom into a career. We have Student Wellness, Office of Student Life, um, the fabulous um, housing area, which at this point right now, we have 226 housing students. Wow. 226. Wow. At this point, Nevada State can no longer call itself a commuter college. Okay, we are a residential institution. And because of that, we have to retrain ourselves how we think about how we're serving our students. And this speaks to equity. Okay, number, a number of our students, they're the new majority. Okay, they are immigrants. They are first generation students. They are part time students. They're vets. They're single parents. That was my crowd. Okay, uh, they're bilingual. They're trilingual. And they don't necessarily work eight to five hours. They don't necessarily can do things in between that eight to five hours. So in the Division of Student Affairs, we are here on Saturdays. Let me say that again. My division is open on Saturdays for students who cannot come during the normal hours. We were here last Saturday and we had a ball. Okay, we had a ball. The programming included Zumba. We had um, Zen in the Den. We had a um, mental health jeopardy. One of the columns was animals, and I know more about elephants and spiders <laughs> and uh, owls than I ever needed to know. But the point is, we had a low number of students attend, but they attended. We were available for them. I'm excited to report September 10th. The cafe will be open as well on Saturdays and Sundays for our housing students. A number of the students, a number of the students that I met at the fabulous new student orientation, the parents questioned, is the cafe open? My son or daughter does not cook. Okay. Um, beautiful housing, stainless steel appliances, but the son or daughter does not cook. Now we can answer to that question, yes, they're going to be open. Yes, they're going to have available hours. So clubs and orgs who have students and participants who can't meet during the normal hours, guess what? We can have a five o'clock at six o'clock meeting and you can come straight from work and get something to eat. So we're really excited uh, to have that opportunity available for our students. Our undocumented students, again, back to career services. We have a wonderful opportunity for the undocumented students. You can get a paid internship paid, P-A-I-D, a check, a W, whatever it is. You can get a check for a paid internship here at the college. So we're really excited uh, to have those opportunities. But before Danette puts up the red folder, I have to talk <laughs> about mental health and our students, okay? We have a phenomenal student wellness team, okay? And we also have some phenomenal faculty because just last week, yes, clap for the faculty, okay? Just last week, okay? <clears throat> We had a student cry out to their faculty and that faculty knew exactly what to do, knew exactly who to call, and that triggered a series of events. And I'll end the story with this. The student is safe. The student is safe. Because we take mental health serious at this campus, that student is safe. And I will tell you this, that parent reached out to Lottera and said, you know what, I knew something was going on. With that added information, we got the student the help that they needed. So really proud of what we're doing in the Division of Student Affairs. Look for more. Look for more relearning of how we think about this college. Really excited for that. We have 30 clubs and orgs starting 30. Last year we had 12. We've wow. got 30 clubs and orgs to the new students class of 2026 who came in and participated in the most phenomenal new student orientation. If you don't see it here, go see Megan Lynch. She will get it here. All the musicians, all the thespians, all the artists, all the uh, actors that I met, all the folks that said I'm a speech team, debate team, I'm an athlete, go see us. Third floor RSC, we are here for our students. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Tremendous. Thank you. We heard a couple of big numbers there. 226. 226. Give a shout out to Bree and Caleb in the housing department. Phenomenal. They are working. That it. is phenomenal. Yes. <laughs> and over 30 clubs. Okay. So here at Nevada State, we are data informed. So Tony, can you tell us a little bit um, from the data perspective about the state of our students? So who are they? What should we know about enrollment, retention, success? What do the numbers say? <laughs> so who are our students? Well, I believe our students are the future. I also believe that we should teach them well and let them lead the way. 
Sorry, that's Whitney Houston. Cut All the right, mic. That's, that's an old <laughs> joke. So they call it. I, I, our students are the future. Uh, an easy way to encapsulate it is a very powerful two word phrase that President Pollard has given us the new majority. So our students, of course, they're students of color who have been historically underrepresented in, in higher education, but they're also first generation students, regardless of their background. They're non traditional students, students transferring in from another place, regardless of where they come from. They're parents and guardians, they're dreamers, they're members of our community and in broad strokes, our students are the reason for which we were founded. The whole idea is that we're giving opportunities to people to achieve at their highest possible level that otherwise would not be there if we didn't exist. So how are we doing in terms of that? Well, when you look at overall growth, uh, we're not where we would be if the pandemic and inflation and everything would have happened. Our, our growth has flattened out a little bit, but honestly, given the circumstances and with all of the hard work that everyone has done, and I don't see it all, but I know what's happening, we're probably doing about as well as we could expect to do under the circumstances with, with our overall growth. And, you know, and looking at where that growth is coming from, kind of divided into different categories. So we got first year students, we rebounded to, to a nice degree with we're about 25% up relative to last year and how many first year students are coming into the college, which is a, a nice step forward. And transfer students, actually a very important population for us as a college to serve them. That population is down a little bit in overall enrollment, like 6%, but we have this R into BSN population where we're, we're not getting nearly as many of those students right now because of all the challenges in the hospitals and the work they have to do in their careers. We're down about 120 students in our R and BSN program. You don't need to know all those details. But if that weren't the case, the bottom line is, uh, if we were even flat with, our, with that particular program, this would be our biggest transfer year ever in the history of the college. And so that's a, a pretty cool thing. So we do have students coming into the college. With continuing students, we're down a little bit in terms of students persisting from one semester to the next. Part of that is actually just due to, we keep graduating more students than ever before. So there are fewer of them here to some degree because they've graduated, but that's the name of the game. Uh, but one of the things we'll really work on in the coming year, and we have been working on, is how can we help more of those students persist and get to that degree? With our, and that's where a lot of our growth is gonna come from as we go forward. So finally, student success. Uh, I kind of divide this up into retention and graduation rates because those are two of the big metrics. Retention is students continuing from year to year. Graduation is obviously earning your degree. With retention, uh, we've hit some historically high levels. So a few years ago, we were at 78%. Then we hit 79% in 2020 of a retention rate, which is really, really good. It dropped last year to 76%, but this year it bounced back up to 78%. Again, so we're already starting to recover and our students are starting to recover. And the really cool thing is everyone talks about narrowing equity gaps and there's work we've got to do in terms of supporting students from all backgrounds. But we've reversed equity gaps when it comes to retention. We have flipped them on their heads. In this past year, our black and Hispanic students have a retention rate of 81%. That's crazy, that's so good. Uh, I mean, that's good no matter what the circumstances are. I mean, I, that's, you know, that, there are our one institutions where that's what they're, they're hitting for their retention rates and we're doing it. Oh, the, okay, all right, final thing. Uh, I got the red, the red folder of doom. So, and then graduation rates. Again, our graduation rates do continue to climb despite all these challenging circumstances. It's a testament to everything you're doing. It's a testament to how hard the students are working. So we've gone from 21% to 23% to 29% to this year, 32% graduation rate for our students. So. <laughs> It's not the finish line, but it's the kind of trajectory we need to have. And so, you know, and I, I started off by saying we're, we're giving students an opportunity to achieve at their highest possible level. We're seeing that in some of those numbers and my data nerdiness and Sandeep data nerdiness uh, that it's happening. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you. Yes. Wonderful. So um, some live reports, we have, we had 40 people online, now 80. I don't know if that data point can be attributed to Tony or not. We'll have to, it's the children of the future, we'll have to investigate more. Um, but you are hearing the term first gen. You hear it in everyone's remarks today. And I actually see a couple students in the audience that had an opportunity to attend a first gen roundtable that Congresswoman Susie Lee hosted. 
to talk about their experience. But want to share, many of you know this statistic, but 49% of our students report being first generation college students. We take it as a point of pride yes. and we're very, very excited to roll out a first and fierce programming that will identify and help provide support for students as they continue their education here with Nevada State College. So stay tuned as we provide more opportunities of how to get involved there. So to do the work that we so passionately do here at the college, we must design and construct what my colleague and friend, Dean Dennis Potoff would say, the next great state university. We are 20 years old now, and many of us have been here for a good amount of time. Some of us have been here from almost the very beginning. Um, under Dr. Pollard's leadership in this last year, we've been making some structural changes that would match this 20 years that we're becoming and also what the future needs are for the institution in order to best serve our students. So some of the roles within the leadership team have changed to meet those goals. Earlier, we had a chance to hear from Dr. Coleman about student affairs and now would like Aaron to give us some updates around advancement. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here to confuse you because we used to have the word advancement in a different department, and I took it and changed it. So I'm going to explain what advancement, what I call advancement 2.0 is. So advancement 2.0, you have seen our work. You just may not know it's us. Um, we are the bulk of the external arm for this campus. So we are marketing. We are public relations. We are events. We are creative services. So a lot of the pamphlets you see, a lot of the portal announcements, all of those things are us. We are the website, which redesign coming. I know you're very excited about that. Everybody can snap on that one. We are fundraising. We are putting names on buildings and inside buildings, and there's still space available. We are alumni relations, and we are the Foundation 501c3 nonprofit arm of this institution. New to us into this whole group is what I'm calling community relations. And we've done some things with this in the past, and it's been under Dr. Fernandez. She's done a fantastic job. We're going to continue some of that work. Later this semester, you're going to see a survey coming to you. I would love to know what you're doing outside of Nevada State so we can support you and help you and also celebrate those who you bring into Nevada State. And the baseline, our job is to help you um, do what you do, let the world know what you're doing, help support you financially, help your alumni know. So my only plug is contact us before you start any of that fun stuff so that we can strategize with you and help you uh, build a great event, build a great uh, group of people to come, alumni, what have you. And just a quick plug, three-fourths of the uh, advancement team is in this room right now working. So when you look at some of the things that we're doing, we are a campus-wide, highly focused, a lot of activities happening. And events like this, you may think it's just our events team with all three of them here. There's actually three-fourths of the team are in this room working right now. So we're doing an absolute ton and happy to promote and support everything you're doing. Thank you. Look at that, wow. right on, on the, the red. Money. On the money. Thank you so much. And I did want to call out, there was one specific question. Are you willing to hold other leaders accountable for diversity, equity, and inclusion, progress, and impact that we received? The short answer is absolutely. Um, but let's talk a little specific about how we've been doing that. Um, there's a couple of things that have happened. You may or may not be aware, we talked about this last week, we've done an addendum to the strategic plan. And I'm gonna read to you the new item, the new wording that is in the strategic plan around this aspect. We are going to examine institutional policies, practices, procedures, and structures from an anti-racist lens in order to identify and implement necessary changes that align with our values in such a way that all students and employees have the opportunity to succeed in their roles at Nevada State College, soon to be university. This is really important to us. I think you'll hear more and more of this as time goes on. The other piece that has been really exciting um, and I'm a part of and I'm very proud to be a part of is we started an anti-racism task force on campus. There's a group of us who are working to really dig into this change in the addendum so that we can make sure that we practice what we preach. And I know Dr. Pollard wanted to speak on that as well. So I, I believe most of you know, I have some pretty uh, profound feelings about this work. So. The short answer to that question is yes. 
Uh, but I think accountability is more complex than simply saying, Darian, are you going to hold people accountable? Is it a part of their evaluation? Uh, for me, and I literally was writing this down, and I love the, the wording in the addendum, and thank you uh, to the team of folks, Dr. Uh, uh, Vicki Shields and the group who worked on this, uh, with also Dr. Fernandez, this idea that policy, procedure, practice, and promise are structure. Um, DEI, and I like to add J on the end of that, justice, a diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice work is not just something that's easily done. Uh, it is both woven and it is obvious. It is work that's about internalization and also the way we externalize the work. It's about being overt and subtle in how we do this work. It's about authenticity and being ever present in the work. And at the end of the day, it's about the macro systems and also the micro systems that are part of the organization. So I am uh, comfortable leading and holding people accountable around DEI work. Uh, but I also want people to know that we're talking about systematic work that has to be done. I, I would also offer to you that Nevada State is far further than many organizations of which I know about in this country because we're willing to name it and we're willing to talk about that. And the fact that we even name the new majority proudly in a state that sometimes does not hear that is important for us to do that work. Let me end by also saying, but the real work of DEI, I can hold an organization accountable. I can look at our policies, our procedures. I can ask the questions. I can create space for other people to do that work. I can take unpopular positions when necessary. I can say no, and I can say yes. Uh, those are the things that I can do, but I'm one part of this ecosystem. What, where the real DEI work happens, DEIJ work, is with each of us individually. It's how we show up in spaces. It's how we choose to articulate. It's how we make space for other people and other voices and other experiences. It's how we check ourselves, right? So I, I, I think at the macro organizational level, there is no doubt. Uh, that that, that is, has been my life work and will continue to do that and will hold the team of folks that I have the privilege of leading all of us to do that work. But I'm gonna challenge you all to say, it's very easy to point a finger without looking at the ones that are coming right back at you. And at the end of the day, if we really want to see work done in this space to create a just organization where every student, employee, community member who visits this campus, lives here, works here, is educated here, is able to thrive, it requires all of us to show up and do that work in very deliberate ways. So let's do it. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. Want to extend a special welcome to Lisa, who is our AVP of infrastructure. We got several questions around what the campus plans are. When are we going to see some development? Can you speak to those? Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to see everyone here. Um, this is a very exciting time for the college, aka university. Um, with campus infrastructure, for those that uh, may not know what we do behind the scenes, we are in fact um, the gatekeepers of all buildings that we all sit and teach and enjoy. We all um, ensure that every building system component is working to your comfort level, including the air conditioning, the utilities and everything uh, as such. And we also assist with um, space management and office assignments. So those that have incoming hires or need to make a switch with where they wanna place their um, constituents, we are also um, happy to assist with that assignment. Very exciting things to come as of we, as we speak, we are currently updating the master plan. The last master plan that was done was back in 2010. Um, you know, 12 years ago, things have changed immensely, especially with the pandemic, the shift of learning and teaching and working may have changed. So now this is an absolute exciting time to update the master plan with what we envision in the next 10 to 25 years down the road. And for most of you, um, most of our facilities have been supported by the State Public Works Division and Board for funding to build new infrastructures. But it's time to kind of think outside the box. Along with the state's assistance, we've also um, 
establish what we call P3, which is public private partnership joint venture that we have outside constituents and developers that are interested in partnering up with Nevada State College to build their facilities to help collaborate with our students and faculty and staff members. For example, I'm sure you've all heard about the um, potential stadium or athletic field that you see up in number 15 up on the screen. Next to it, you'll see number 17, Clark County School District is interested in building you know, a choice high school. So with that collaboration, along with further down student rec, student housing towards the east side, and all of our academic cores will greatly bond our community in terms of enhancing our learning, enhancing our experience, enhancing our uniqueness of why this campus is special. Along to the east side of the campus, you would also see that we have partnerships with hospitals and hotels and all that fun stuff. So this master plan is slated to complete um, early October, and um, we are very excited for what the next decade or two will bring. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> and thank you to those that have been part of the steering committee. Okay, this is hot off the press from the brilliant Sandeep. With summer graduations being posted daily, our six year graduation just went up to 33%. Woo so just FYI, it, that number is 32% yesterday. So let's keep at it. We're doing this thing. Eric, how's it going down there? Good. <laughs> so pillar number four, want to talk about becoming an employer of choice. We had many questions in this section that were about specific lived experience of our employees. Can you talk us through your points and some of the developments in sure. your area? Good morning, everybody. Danette, I'm sorry, I'm probably gonna ignore a little bit of that red folder. Big topics to talk about in a couple minutes. So, um, and I know I got a text from Amy, we wanna get to live questions, I will do my best, but I wanna give the time to our employees because we're here for students we all recognize that i'm here for you i'm here for the employees and i want to make sure that we have enough opportunity to talk about uh the exciting things that are, are going to be coming forward as i was sitting here listening to everybody talk and uh learn about our great students and the services that we provide what popped into my brain is a question that i would i would put to you and i would ask you to to have that in your in your mind as we move forward is why are you here what what's your why for being here um i recognize we recognize we are a small public institution we are limited in what we can provide in terms of our, our staffing levels our salaries we're going to do the best we can we're going to be innovative um but we have to have a why and 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 if i can just be so direct if the why is simply based on kind of those pieces, the salary, the benefits. I think it, for me, I would be challenged because I'm, I'm here for our students and, and I'm here for the great work that we're doing. Uh, I say that as a lead in um, to talk about many of the questions we received were related to faculty salaries um, and what can we do to address those. And, and we are going to address those compensation and classification is going to be part of our overall HR redesign. Um, but we're going to have limitations. We're going to have to be creative. We're going to have to be innovative. And, and I shared with some of the panelists this morning some data. And I, I want to I just want to share it very just very directly. When, when you look at our peer institutions, our funding is half of the median institution funding. We're, we were, as of the data last year, 53 million. The median institution has 103 million in funding. Where the challenge comes in is we serve the same amount of students as those institutions. So we're serving the same amount of students, I, I would say at a higher level. We do, as, as Dr. Pollard said, we have the best faculty and staff in the country. That funding level limits our ability and what we can do and, and how we can approach different situations. So we have to be innovative. We have to be creative in the way that we do that. And I know the red folder just came up, so I'm just gonna finish with, I know I didn't get to all the questions. We are going to have a kickoff for the HR redesign uh, process. We will have a kickoff meeting. Everybody will be invited. It'll be an opportunity to learn in detail what we're going to be doing. 
um, what we're going to be focused on. Uh, and with that, because I'm a little flustered with the red folder in my face, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna pause uh, there. Great. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Can I? No. So uh, many different factors we're looking at in the redesign, one of which is compensation and classification. As part of that, we will be putting together a compensation philosophy committee. I've received recommendations from our faculty senate from NFA uh, for faculty representation on that group. The scope of that work, the, what that work will, or that group will be doing will be to develop Nevada State's first, and there's going to be a lot of firsts coming out of this redesign, compensation philosophy, which essentially is a document that details how we're going to approach compensation here at the institution. It's not going to give the details between the, in terms of the calculation, but it's going to give our overarching philosophy of how we're going to approach compensation gives us an opportunity to be innovative think outside the box how can we make sure that our faculty and staff who are incredible who are putting forth so much effort and making this institution incredible how can we make sure that they are compensated appropriately so that they can continue to do that work great thank you uh, dr pollard your fifth pillar inspires us to build economic mobility for our students we received a question from an employee perspective. How will we continue to be great if we are in the middle class? And for many of us, costs are rising, but pay is not. Our classified employees especially come to mind here. Yeah, I appreciate that question for a couple of reasons. Um, one is I'm always struck, and you're all going to hear me try to do this in my language and encourage everyone else to do this. We oftentimes talk about these issues just in terms of faculty. I think we need to start, and because the way in which the pay structure within the state of Nevada and the organizational structure is done, um, compensation for classified employees are typically designed based on the collective bargaining unit of state employees. Yet, there are things within the organization that we have to be deliberate that we can look at and try to focus on. So those are the issues I'm going to be saying faculty and staff more, faculty and staff, so that we put that as a part of our working uh, lexicon as an institution about what's important to us in both of those spaces. So the first thing I'm going to say at the macro level, if you want to talk about these issues, we need to make sure that we're voting. That's the first thing I'm going to tell you. Voting means something because the people who make the decisions regarding our budgets and our policies and procedures, they are elected into office. It's important to be thoughtful about that when you go to make your votes. And if you don't vote, shame on you. Vote. Secondly, uh, we want to make sure that we're doing the appropriate advocacy. So you all will have hopefully saw at the special board meeting, uh, one of the first things that the board is advocating for as we step into the legislative cycle is around compensation for employees. That was number one. And there were a few of us who insisted that that is called out. Not that it wasn't at the consciousness of our system office, but it needed to be named that this is something that's important to us. And in those private and direct conversations that we're having with decision makers, it's important for us, those of us who are in leadership roles to do that. And then third, uh, what I have charged Eric to do and then all of the senior team is they are looking at ways in which we are crafting mobility and uh, career ladders within the organization. How do we begin to clearly identify those that we follow a policy and procedure around that? I'm, I know several of them are probably tired of me. They'll say, can we do this or should we do this? I'll say, what does the policy say? And part of what we have to do is to make sure our policies are aligned and if they're silent on things that we give them words so that we can do the things that we need to do to treat employees consistently and fairly. I think there's a perception oftentimes that who you know, who you connect with uh, helps benefit you. We want to ameliorate those ideas. Um, we are humans and there are flaws all the time that exist in the systems, but it's important for us to, I think, work very diligently to have clear processes to work through them. I know it frustrated people uh, this past year around our remote work policy. But as I share with oftentimes our governance leaders when I meet with them, that's how I believe good policy is done. You draft it, you vet it, you get feedback. There are things in that policy that I didn't necessarily think should be in there, but we're going to do that and what's in there and we're going to assess it. 
So how do we look at this over time? That's the same way we do when we look at compensation of employees. We need to be very thoughtful about what is the marketplace saying? What are the rules that we have to operate in that are set by our governing board and by our INCHI system? And then what are the things that we can do as an institution that we may not have fully explored or even articulated? So that was a broad answer. Um, I, 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 what I also think the question is one me to acknowledge and hear that. And I acknowledge and hear that. Uh, this is a very difficult time for employees. Many spaces, I've heard that. I had an employee talk to me about selling plasma. I've heard employees talk to me about the concerns about purchasing gas money. I've heard employees talk to me about uh, accessing public support services because, or getting a second or third job. I can't fix all of that, but what I can do is acknowledge it, and then I can try and create a just organization that at least creates the opportunity for you to thrive. The last one I'm going to say is, well, let me stop there because I was going to get Oh, it was going to be good. You can't leave us. It probably wasn't going to be good, so I better stop this. I'll take you for your word then. Thank you. Okay, we are going to transition to answering questions from the audience. We do have a microphone over there. If there are questions, as folks approach... I'm gonna ask Aaron to talk a little bit. We got a party. We got a birthday bash. We had a couple things going on. Um, so uh, Saturday will be the exact 20th anniversary of this college beginning. Woo. We. <laughs> <laughs> 177 students in Dawson. It's changed a little bit, right? So tomorrow night, we are going to be celebrating here on campus. And I believe this will be the biggest event we've ever had on our campus ever. As of right as of right now, I'm looking at Danielle, 527 RSVPs. Going to be a big party. Here's what you can do. This is the coolest thing that I think is so great. As you may or may not know, our food pantry has been depleted very quickly at the start of the semester. So if you bring a um, something to refill the food pantry, either hygiene items or something for the food pantry, you're going to get some really cool 20th anniversary um, swag. One piece that I'm hoping we do is the coolest piece of swag I've ever seen. It's a portable speaker. It looks like a cassette tape because we're 90s themed, right? 90s, early 2000 themed. Um, it looks like a speaker and we actually have our own 20th anniversary Spotify playlist on it. So. Aww. I get one first, like I really want one. So we're gonna battle, so I'm bringing all the stuff, but no, I'm just kidding. So come tomorrow night, we look forward to celebrating with you. Wonderful. Great, thank you. Okay, it does not look like there are any questions as we, oh, Laura, do you mind to use the microphone? Oh, that's okay. This is so official. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for your panel and uh, the, the comments and posting some of the questions that uh, faculty, staff, and potentially students may have submitted. I just wanted to, and apologies for the rambling because it's still formulating in my mind, but to come back to the comments that uh, Eric made around compensation and the organizational culture that we're trying to build here um, at the college. You know, I think we recognize that Nevada as a state does not invest as much in higher education as it should. And so to Dr. Pollock's point, please vote. Um, the legislature decides much of our fate in terms of funding. Um, but uh, with the limitations around salary, um, I think that, as you mentioned, we want to try to be innovative and creative in ways that we can support our faculty and staff. And if there are limitations to raising salaries, what are the other things that you can do to recognize and reward the work um, of our hardworking faculty and staff? And I know I saw one of the questions up there asking about the award ceremonies. Um, I will personally say that I was very disappointed that we did not have a campus-wide award ceremony last year. Again, a really hard year coming out of the pandemic for our faculty and staff. I would have liked to have seen them recognized. It sounds like there will be one this year, but I, I don't want to lose sight that we have not acknowledged the accomplishments from last year. We need to keep acknowledging the accomplishments of our faculty and staff this year. Um, recognition is audibly free. That helps, but we need to find ways to also create boundaries so that our faculty and staff can have good work-life balance 
That means that we need to prioritize hires so that we can provide relief for folks that are wearing multiple hats. So I would love to hear any comments or, or other things that maybe hadn't been mentioned and how we might be working to um, not only do external work, but also internal work. Thank you. Do the macro part and Aaron, I'll turn over to you. I, Laura, I want to tell you, thank you for that. Um, for a couple of reasons for me, um, I think, and many of you have heard me say this, I hope, if you haven't, let me say it now. Uh, I really sit on the, the altar of, of gratitude. And I think one of the things, and I love what you said there, we may not always have the resources to do the, all the things that we may read that the private sector does or organizations or states that are larger than us, but what we can do is to acknowledge and recognize. Last year was a very unique year and, and a lot of different reasons. Besides it being my first year here, we were also in the midst of this transition in COVID. So if you can recall, there was still a debate whether or not we were actually here or not. Um, and, and, and what we tried to do in that space was to say, okay, let's, let's be very thoughtful about uh, having, uh, when we recognize by the end of the fall, we can do some type of joint recognition and holiday. That was the intent to try and start that. Um, uniquely or not uniquely, because I think we are still in a lot of ways evolving and growing as an institution, there isn't a documented history of this. So I'll say, well, what was the plan? Well, last year we did this, the year before we did that, or such and such and such. So I think part of this is also codifying. Uh, some of you have been a part of my conversations about an academic institutional calendar that captures these things, that we start to record it, that we are able to plan. It wasn't really up until two months before commencement, if I'm correct, that we actually had a location for a commencement last year so part because we we changed the date every other year i there, there are some things that we've got to ritualize so that we're able to do that that being said if we need to have anyone who accepts the fault on not having had the recognition you can blame it on me and i say that very thoughtfully because it was not an intent uh, my goal is always say thank you to everybody for what you do every day and showing up and i try to express that but part of it is also trying to recognize what's the rhythm of the institution, uh, what is the practice or protocols we've had in this, and then be able to document that so we can act on it. Uh, but so I, uh, I am sorry that we did not do what people are accustomed to having had us seen do last year. We tried to improvise and do something different. I'm hopeful that what we're planning this year, again, as another sort of transition year, that by next year, we will have had a codified system of how we're gonna move forward. But thank you for giving voice to that. Erin, can you talk about what we're gonna do this year? Yeah, I think um, the one thing that COVID did do for us is gave us the opportunity to take a look at what we had been doing and whether it made sense or not. So um, just as an example, the, the past, the award ceremony was happening in April. And if we want to start looking at evaluations of faculty and staff to help the supervisors decide if they should create a, a nomination for a particular individual for an award. Well, you may not be aware, but staff evaluations don't end until like March or April or May even as far. So we really wanted to move the award ceremony to the next academic year so we could complete that cycle and allow staff especially to have the opportunity to submit nominations for awards. With the cycle where it was before, it was a little off. So there's two things that I've been tasked to do that we've been working on as a leadership team, which if you're not aware, the leadership team is a broad group of people across campus, um, VPs, AVPs, deans, a variety of different directors to help help us work on some of this work in the in the campus community. So I've been focused on two things, how we select the awards and when we have the awards. So for the win, kind of explained the end of the semester of the spring semester has been a bit difficult. So the leadership team will be tasked in the next couple of months to help us figure out when we're going to do this for 2023. For 2022, we are combining again an award ceremony with a holiday party. And this is, I'm going to use the word, I'm sorry, this is the last of the pivot from COVID, right? We're gonna pivot and we're gonna be done. And I hate that word and I apologize. Um, so that's the end of this. And then we are changing the, the timing of it. The leadership team will give us the opportunity to help us decide what that looks like. So then the how. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, the foundation actually has been supporting this event and the winners for years now. And at one point there was a foundation board member who was part of the selection process and that went away. And so what we said was, let's stop and decide what makes the most sense for Nevada State University today. And what we've decided is the leadership team came together. We had a couple of options and they have voted. 
We are going to go back as a leadership team, determine how that committee is structured and put together. And then my hope is that we can put out the announcement for nominations in the next month or so and have that committee come together to make the selections for the faculty and staff award winners. So again, I think it really speaks to what Dr. Pollard is saying. We need to be able to create some systems around this so that we have consistency year over year. So again, little timing off, little process off, but I think we're gonna come to something that makes sense. And you know, this is the best part of working at a place like this. If we throw this on the wall and it doesn't stick, there's nothing saying we have to do it this way for the rest of our lives as well. So I'm really excited to see how this works and see what makes sense and see if we change in the future or we stay this way. So I hope that helps. And, and I'll, I'll be brief as well. So I, I'll take an additional opportunity to talk about some of the great things that'll be coming out of out of human resources. So when you look, the research is clear of what, what drives employees, what, what keeps employees at organizations. So three key initiatives that will be coming out of the redesign. One is employee benefits and wellness. So we can't change the PEB benefits. We can't change those formal benefits, but what we can do is we can augment that and we can add additional benefits to our employees, whether that be through, um, the, the alternative work arrangement that is that's a, a a benefit that that we have to our employees but also wellness we we heard about the students and the mental mental well-being that's going to be a key focus because as employees you're going through the same stress levels the same life experiences that our students are that are creating those 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 stressors in your life so to be able to provide beyond just the employee assistance program a full range employee well-being uh, i'm going to i'm going to steal tech millennials happiness and well-being mm -hmm. really let's support the employee 360 and and that's going to be the focus in addition to that and and beyond just the formal awards we've got a keen focus on employee recognition what additional programs can we put in place to recognize the work of our employees because y'all are great you are busting it every single day. The last two years have been the most stressful and it's continuing to become uh, challenges as we return. So I wanna make sure that we have opportunities to recognize uh, the work that you're doing. I said I had three, I forgot what the third one is. Please come to the kickoff when it is announced and we'll talk through uh, in more detail. Great, thank you. I wanna recognize the student at the mic. All right, hello, uh, my name is Dane Vasquez. I am a student here at Nevada State College, as well as a representative from Nevada State Student Alliance, which is the student body government here on campus. Um, so I just want to address the topic of the name change. <clears throat> um, so I was actually, uh, I was actually given a, me and the other, the entire student body government was given a presentation of the name change uh, by Anthony Ruiz, this beautiful presentation. Um, but my question is, I just want to know, how can you ensure that this institution's mission will not be lost during this name change? We see other institutions like UNLV and UNR, and it's clear that their mission is not on the students. It's not a focus on the students. It's clearly on research. And um, I just want to, so as someone who is elected to this, to my position, because to represent the students, um, and as a student myself, I am fearful that with this name change, we may lose our mission on our focus of the, um, focus on the students. So, uh, if you can, if there's anything that maybe you can ensure that our mission not be lost during your presidency, um, as well with your team, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I think there, I'd like to uh, bifurcate two things that I heard you saying there. Uh, there's the issue of mission and there's the issue of culture. Um, and I, I believe that the, this name change uh, will not affect both of them, but one in particular we have the ability to protect more and that being culture. Mission is actually statutorily defined for us. Uh, we are the state college of the state of Nevada and we have a very different mission as defined by the code here. Our mission is about um, the mid tier as they call it within the Carnegie classifications where what are our, we may produce research at this institution and we have exceptional faculty who do that that is not our primary mission. Uh, our primary mission is to provide teaching and to provide teaching excellence in the way that it is done. We're very deliberate about the majors that we offer because we're meeting uh, immediate needs uh, that help drive the economy of our region, but not entry level. 
Uh, that is the work that's primarily done at the two-year sector. Our job is to really build and to grow not only the middle class, but those above that, and to deepen the well of leadership within the local community. So we know that space very well. It's about access. It's about making sure that students have an affordable option, which is why our tuition is less than that of UNLV and UNR, why our operating expenses are different, why the funding formula is different. We were designed for that in mind. And it would take an act of the legislature to change that. This name change does not do that. But what I heard implicit in what you asked is not really about mission, because mission is not something that we're going to change, and that's not what's being proposed here. What I heard you talk about so beautifully is about our culture. It's the thing that jumped off the page at me when I chose to apply for this job. It's the thing every time, many of you talk about this, but the person I love to hear talk about the most is Tony. Um, he has this way of capturing when he talks about what's special about this college. It's about when we are looking at our website and we look at our materials and we talk about the intentionality about the student experience. It's when I listen to Stephanie glow about being here four or five hours on this weekend because she got to be here with students or watching our faculty in the hallway talking to students about their experience, not teaching assistants, not uh, folks who are saying, that, oh, come see me here because, you know, this is what I, I, I really don't teach, but I'll, I'll spend some time with you. I just let, that's not what we do here. So that protecting and claiming that culture and abiding in it in a way that is profound and honest. And this is why I tell our regents, I tell everybody in the state, all these newspaper articles I've been saying, I don't want to be at an R1. I don't want to be there. There is a distinct purpose for that in our educational system, and I celebrate them. We need them to produce new scholarship, to drive innovation, to go out and make new discoveries. We need that, and I celebrate that. And we need our community colleges because they are providing access, open access to thousands of folks who would not consider higher education an option for them, and they're building entry-level work. But y'all know what? We got the sweetest spot in the higher education, because folks come to us because they want to be here, they want to be taught, our faculty and our staff come here because they want to be a part of this mission. And if this mission isn't what you want to be a part of, and this distinctive culture of Nevada State, we fight to protect that even as we're growing, even as we're developing, even as we are moving into that next part of our life. So I'm with you. I'm all in on that protecting this culture. And more importantly, I'm all about this mission. So thank you for that. That's great. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. Mick. <clears throat> Mick, I believe we are winding down here. But come, you can come talk with the folks as they're coming off the stage. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to everyone. We are now going to transition to Dr. Fernandez and our wonderful governance panel. I do also want folks to know that we are going to be an early voting site here on the 31st of October and the 1st. So you can build that into your plans. Thank you. Yes. So um, Dr. Pollard has been invited to be part of an education roundtable that is being hosted literally on the other side of the world at uh, City National. So we'll be heading that way and we'll share that with you as soon as that publishes as well. Thank you so much. All right, good morning, panelists. Come up and take a seat. We're going to jump right into panel number two. Thank you, President Pollard, the leadership team. Thank you, Amber, especially. I'm, I'm excited to be with you and, and host the second panel. Um, just want to say a few words about the new division of culture planning and policy. One of our major goals is to help build a cohesive culture on campus through interconnectivity, responsiveness, and action. And I firmly believe that bringing these governing groups together is an example of that and make sure that we're all participating in this process. We're communicating, we're collaborating, we're conspiring together. And it was exciting to hear just in the lobby, we had Susan from CEC talking with the folks from Faculty Senate about potentially um, having uh, codified uh, more of a 
presence of CEC involved in Faculty Senate as I believe as a advisor. They'll correct me on the correct term, but that just happened in the lobby. So we're, on, we're off to a good start. Um, I'm honored to welcome our representatives from our different uh, college governance groups. During today's panel, each representative will introduce themselves and I'll ask the representatives to share a little bit about themselves, their organization, their needs, their visions, make a ask as well. This is what we're here for. So permitting, time permitting, we'll then open it up to the audience as well. So we're keeping our eye on Danette. Thank you, Danette. And to kick things off, we will start with Amaya. Your question is, give us your 60 second elevator speech on what your governance group is, how employees can get involved, and why we should get involved. Okay. Um, hello, I am Amaya Henley. I am with Nevada State Student Alliance, NSSA, and I am the Executive Vice President within our government. So we are the official student government of Nevada State College. Um, NSSA takes pride in advocating for the NSC student body. The organization, we are made up of a diverse group of students. We work diligently to enrich the student experience. We amplify their voice. We give them events. We facilitate those events. We offer scholarships. We link resources to them. And overall, we just aid in their need and whatever they could possibly need from us from their four years at our institution. We are also the bridge between Stop College <laughs> administration and, and the students. And we are just honored to represent our students when we are here. Our faculty can get involved by coming to our meetings and just asking for our support with anything they could possibly want to initiate on our campus. And we welcome them to our events also because it is helpful for students to see like, oh, there's the president at an event. There's the vice president at our events. And it shows that, you know, adults aren't always scary. So. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Susan, I'd love for you to add Hi, Susan Geerling. I'm the vice chair for the CEC um, and our organization. I'm just going to read something Phoebe, who couldn't be here today, uh, wanted me to share. As, as members of the Nevada State Classified Employee Council, it is our mission to recommend general policy, provide forum discussion on matters of classified staff and welfare rights, as well as disseminating college information to classified employees. The council uh, strives to establish and maintain rapport and communication among all classified employees, administration, as well as the Nevada state community. The council encourages and promotes the personal growth and development of all classified employees. Our goal is to aid in the enhancement of skills talents, potential career mobility of classified employees through training, advocacy, and other available opportunities. The council serves as a body through which the professionalism of classified staff is articulated, valued, and respected. We lead by listening, by example, and with transparency. Um, we also help to coordinate with different interests on, on campus, um, we reach out to uh, faculty senate on issues that may we may be able to work with them on. And just by virtue of being a classified employee at Nevada State, everybody's a member. So we welcome everybody's participation and encourage it. Thank you, Susan. We'll go next to Layla. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Dr. Layla Pazargadi. I am an associate professor in English, um, the Nepantla Summer Bridge director, and in this, this year serving as your Nevada Faculty Alliance chapter president here for um, Nevada State. And I also have with me Lori Navarrete, who's a past president and um, weighing in here and advising us this year. Um, who are really excited about NFA work, um, and those of you who know me know I am particularly passionate and excited about it. Um, we hope to use the NFA or employ it as an arm to um, help reflect faculty concerns, particularly about labor conditions, 
um, pay in particular, we um, support and, and facilitate the grievance process if that comes up. We work closely with FAC Senate as well as a leadership team um, and our president and provost um, in trying to find solutions for faculty. We um, have a lot of different vari or various activities throughout the year. For instance, we put on workshops and trainings for faculty for their annual review process, for instance, so some of those proactive things, and then also talking about um, you know, concerns that come up for faculty. We are open to um, academic and administrative faculty, um, but in particular, we find that a lot of our members who are active are um, lecturers at PTIs, actually, and um, full-time faculty as well. Um, so we hope that you look for our activities. We'll be emailing you about them. We have a mixer coming up on September 15th at 4 p.m. in Henderson, and we'll email you about that. And um, yeah, I think I'll just end it there. Thank you. Thank you. And, and take note, we also have slides to just kind of highlight some of the things that are being shared with our representatives. We'll go next to Angelo. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Angelo Larocco. I'm a faculty. Uh, for the School of Nursing, Lecture of Nursing, and I'm one of the senators uh, for Senate as an academic representative. And believe it or not, um, this is my second time serving as senator, and I wasn't sure at first, you know, I did it the first time as a proxy back in spring 2018, and I wasn't quite sure at the time, you know, what am I doing here? Just, you know, just, am I just showing up, hearing different uh, contexts about uh, what Senate is about? And I come to realize that Senate is a big process in which everyone has a voice when they want to share big concerns, not just from the faculty perspective, but just learning to hear different viewpoints on how an institution is run. And I, I come to realize that being part of that is important to disseminate information and often viewpoints that sometimes are not always talked uh, about. And so I agreed again to serve as Senator this year because I do miss being an advocate for faculty. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons as Senator is that we want to communicate and listen to different viewpoints with our constituents. So I would say that Faculty Senate is the representation of not just hearing what we represent from our faculty members, but to also come together and listen to the viewpoint and come to a consensus. And so we, we uh, do different things in Senate. And as you guys are, are aware of, uh, and uh, Christine Beaudry is our faculty president this year, we do send out public emails regarding what you guys want us to hear on the agenda. So I would encourage any faculty members out there that if you want something brought to Senate that deserves to be heard or recognized, uh, please do so because this is that forum in which those ideas and concerns uh, should be discussed. And that's kind of what I want to say about that. Thank you. I mean, it's real apparent we're seeing the theme of listening to each other, communicating, advocating. So that's in common throughout the groups for sure. Um, as we move to our next question, we all know students are at the core of everything we do. And it's obvious that we would not be here without each other. We know that administrative faculty depend on classified staff. We know that academic faculty depend on administrative faculty. We know students depend on classified staff and all of the faculty, and the inverse holds as well. So I wanted to ask each of you, as someone who's chosen to lead in your governance group, what advice do you have on the number one way to support someone from another governance group? And we're going to start this off with Susan. Um, well, I, I believe the CEC is all about inclusion and participation, encouraging classified employees to participate in the CEC. We have committees. Um, some of our committees work in the community, actually. Uh, our social committee has been great at uh, providing opportunities, reaching out to uh, organizations like the Salvation Army when we did a homeless um, donation and distribution over the holidays. So inclusion and participation really are the two big things that I think bring us uh, together and, and would help support our members and also the NSC community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Layla, I pose the same question to you. 
Thank you so much. I like to think about the three C's for something like this in terms of collaboration, communication, and conflict resolution. So especially for you know, union members and, and working with, um, you know, trying to represent the faculty perspective and working with other groups, of course, we believe in collaboration and communication because it's really key, especially in the leadership team meetings and the individual meetings um, with folks back Senate, um, the college president, uh, the college provost in particular, but also conflict resolution because that can come up as well, as I mentioned before, the grievance process, as well as thinking through other kinds of, um, you know, kind of conflicts on campus that might arise for faculty who don't necessarily want to go through grievance, but just might need a supportive base to kind of help them troubleshoot through, through those issues. Wonderful, thank you. Um, our next question, I'm going to have Tessa kick us off. How would you like to collaborate with each other and engage in co-advocacy? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, thank you for that question. And just to reiterate, I'm Tessa Spinoza. I'm the president of NSSA. Um, and how I would like to receive that support and to answer your question, I would say to um, what would help is open and meaningful communication with all the staff and faculty on our campus and to be able to share as much information as we possibly can. But on top of it, to also support one another. And what I mean by that is like this communication would be able to provide students with events, resources, and opportunities that truly benefit them and also show what they can gain from Nevada State College. So I feel like being able to have that open and meaningful communication with all, even if it's just a simple hey or checking up on one another, that's really beneficial for, I feel like, all of us, especially as students. I feel like being able to have that from academic staff and faculty really meaningful. But I feel like it's meaningful as well for students to reach out to academic staff and faculty and, saying, and giving them that checkup as well. So that's what I feel like is really having that open and meaningful communication, even if we don't know one another, it's nice to be able to say, hey, or how's it going, or something like that, to make sure that I'm fine. So I feel like that's something that really helps one another. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Lori, please introduce yourself. I'd love for you to answer that as well. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm Lori Navarrete, and um, I'm one of the veterans here. I've been here at NSC for 17 years, so, um, and an NFA member for that long. <laughs> and full so, professor. Same, yeah, and just, yeah, thank you. So just lots of good changes going on. Um, always uh, been an advocate for our uh, faculty and staff in various ways and learning from others. So to answer that question, we already have some mechanisms in place um, now in which um, our, our governance um, representatives work together. So faculty, um, Senate uh, leadership and NFA leadership often collaborate on issues and white papers and um, uh, we have a shared vision of goals um, and, and we uh, spend a lot of time together in, in addressing issues such as you know, workload, salary, compensation, um, some of the things you've heard today. Uh, as well, we've been very fortunate over the years that I've been here to work with um, our president and provost. Um, they've been very open to meeting with our, our, uh, rep, our leadership on Senate and NFA. I know currently Layla and Christine meet with the president together, and I know they both also meet with the provost, and uh, so that's been a great thing. We also in the past have worked more closely with classified staff, but I could definitely see um, some of our issues are similar and I can see working more collaboratively this year as well as with NSSA. Um, and uh, there was one other thing I was gonna say. Oh, thank you, Eric. I think you confirmed, I don't know if Eric is still here, but I think you confirmed that we will have a representative on the Compensation Philosophy Committee. So we mm -hmm. often try to get ourselves on, on those important committees that do affect um, faculty and staff. So appreciate that. Thank you, Lori. I, it's also evident in every person sharing, you have resources to share with each other. Something as simple as if NSSA or CEC wants to have sample briefing papers, white papers, you've got a great source right there. So I encourage you to share each other's resources, skills, expertise. Um, I'm going to move to Baden and ask him, what aspirations do you have when looking to the future of governance at Nevada State? Well, I think I just uh, reiterate what's already been said in a lot of ways, just continued uh, collaboration. Uh, uh, Vice President Fernandez talked about having an advisory member from the Classified Employee Council on the Senate, and I think that's just a great idea and just continue to have those lines of communication uh, with each other. Um, I think that 
Um, uh, within Senate, I think there's a continued, uh, we're continually always looking at ways to improve ourselves uh, in terms of our structure and in terms of our method of communication. Uh, the pandemic definitely has played a role in that as we've been on Zoom uh, for the past couple of years. We're going to continue to have that format, but we're making a couple structural changes in terms of the means of communication and how the Senate meetings will go that I think will help improve uh, the experience in the Senate meetings. And so I would just say we're just we're always open as a as the Senate uh, leadership team. We're always open to ideas for for improvement and always looking at our structure and how we can can better improve ourselves. Thank you, Amaya. I'll ask you the same. What does the future hold? What do you envision? Um, I'm going to build off of Tessa's answer. It, it's that open communication, just people coming to NSSA saying, what can we do to help? And I think it's also us going to them, like, how can we help since we are that bridge between you guys and the students? Um, it can be a bit daunting to go to administration at times, um, but it's easier to say, hey, there's a fellow student. Let me say what I need to say to them, and then they can take it to the appropriate resources. Um, so I will say what I have like appreciated over the summer is a lot of departments have come to NSSA asking for representation of a student voice because we are students first and I think that will, I think that's the future of the shared governance from NSSA's perspective. Thank you, thank you. Layla, I turn to you. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate this um, that NSSA just brought up, student voice, because we also think about that. Um, in terms of the faculty, as well as um, other folks who are engaged at the NFA, the idea of like, what does what kind of mechanisms can we put in place to strengthen our voice? And I actually think that uh, in the future, probably a collective bargaining agreement could achieve that. And I think it could be productive in a lot of ways where faculty or those who are organizing can say, look, we want to we want a seat at the table. And we want to be able to work with you to address the issues and concerns that we have, as opposed to some of these things kind of getting um, potentially not, well, not getting, um, it's being addressed, right? But maybe not having it, what was that? Yeah, per perhaps prioritizing the way that those who come together and sit at a table can do that. So I think when we think about the future and this idea of the crystal ball, um, that can actually be a mechanism, I think, that can uh, solve a lot of issues and potentially counteract frustrations that we're seeing from faculty and folks about labor, especially with these questions that come up. And I um, noticed that when Eric was talking about like the research about employee benefits and recognition that go a long way towards helping faculty and folks feel good about their position here, I think the third one that I would highlight here, particularly in our increased inflationary existence here in Vegas is pay, right? That, that would be the one that I would say could be at the top of the list to look at as well, that employees really depend on that and, and you know, the ability to be able to talk about pay and potentially advocate um, for increased pay mechanisms. So, yeah. Well, it's exciting to hear about yeah, you know, everyone agreeing about the importance of communicating, collaborating with each other. That's really going to strengthen your advocacy. And we'll add another layer that that's across the state as well. We, you each have counterparts in every entry institution. So that's a very powerful network. And what I've been talking to NSSA about networking and the power of networking. So I'm excited for the future of all these groups coming together and lending a hand across the state as well. And I'm really excited that our new division, Culture Planning and Policy, we're going to play a role in this. Um, President Pollard has concentrated attention on culture planning and policy. We have a team, it's going to be Sandeep. Uh, Amy, Marcella, their departments that we're going to think about giving some concentrated focus effort on building this culture. So I'm looking forward to working with each of you very closely. And that gives us time for questions from the audience. We have a mic on the side. Mick. To, and please direct it to all or specific panelists, not me. <laughs> Just kidding. 
the scariest thing in the world, Mick going to the mic. <laughs> my, my question earlier, and I'm just going to ask it, those earlier panelists said, go vote. For who? I mean, what does that mean to us as an institution to help education? And, you know, you have labor unions downtown that build a list of candidates that they support. Um, is there such a thing for education by education people? If that's okay, we can at least jump in to say that the NFA, no one's on, yeah. <laughs> The NFA with AUP is drafting that list as we speak. So I was engaged in a meeting last weekend where we went through candidate by candidate um, to, in, to figure out who we would endorse as part of the state NFA, the Nevada Faculty Alliance, who are pro-education for exactly that. So once that list is compiled, we will share that with um, part-time, full-time faculty, our members. So at least that's, we can say that we have a mechanism for that and such a list will come out. I can't speak for others. Please vote for NC Regents. We potentially could have four, four new regents, potentially five, actually. Um, so that's going to change the whole governance. Um, we'll have Anna Sese to maybe answer as well. I know just yesterday, Kevin, Kevin brought Congresswoman Lee. Now, I know that's federal level, but um, Anna Sese, what do you think that you could do too when it comes to who should we vote for? No, that's a great question. I feel like I really love the idea of um, what uh, Dr. Lila Pazagardi was saying about having the endorsement. I feel like that's something that I would like personally from students to be able to have because I feel like you uh, you guys did all the research and I feel like it's nice to have the research driven like backed up from that and I feel like you wouldn't lead us in the wrong direction. So I feel like again that like we can have that collaboration saying hey this is something that from Nevada State College, this is what we've been seeing. And for students, if you are interested, I feel like that's something that we can kind of pass down as well. I feel like that's something that's really interesting and I would love just because voting does help. And I feel like, especially with Board of Regents, they kind of help or decide our, educa our education and decide if who's allowed to get money in what areas and what sectors. So especially with Board of Regents, I feel like we need to have more people that are educated in those positions or more people who are actually wanting to help students, not just wanting to gain what's uh, what's from the Board of Regents. So I feel like that's something that's making sure that we kind of do the due diligence to actually find out and do the research of who's really gonna help students and actually ask them those questions saying, hey, what are you actually gonna do when it comes to um, our legislation, when it comes to passing our, um, like any kind of education re reformation or anything that happens within our schools, how are they diligent? How are they doing their research within making those uh, within making those academic decisions? So I feel like that's something that I really do. Um, I really love that Dr. Pazagardi and their team uh, really had that initial, but I feel like voting, like what also Lara said too, I feel like I really love that being able to be really di due diligent and I feel like we have to be really vig vigilant. I feel like especially with the new minority that we have here within Nevada State College, I feel like we have to protect every single student and protect their voices who those who can't even vote as well. So I feel like too is being able to protect those who don't have that voice and being able to do the research to making sure you're protecting as many students as you can. So I feel like that's something that I really like being able to do the right research and also connecting with those who are really interested. So I do have a senator here, Kevin Osorio, who's really interested in Susie Lee, but he's also really interested in politics. So I feel like if you were interested, we do have NSSA members who are interested in politics and will lead you in the kind of right direction of where to go. So thank you again for that question. I really do appreciate it, where to find, uh, where to vote properly, especially when it comes to education. Mm -hmm. Talk so fast. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a president for you. So thank you, Tessa. Let me remind everyone we're an early, we're gonna be an early voting site. So mark your calendars. That's as early as October 31st and November 1st. So it's gonna come right to our door. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to mention that um, Dr. Marcela Rodriguez Campo, she, um, I have asked her to kind of take a lead in encouraging folks across campus, students, faculty, staff, to make public comment at the ENSHE meetings. She's gonna provide some direction templates so that collectively or individually, you go to the mic and you speak out. Know that you have a right to do that as an individual, as uh, working here at Nevada State College. 
it's an expectation actually that we should have of each other. So watch out for that coming from Marcela. I know that many of us are gonna be at the Elko Board of Regents meeting and we have a lot to say. We have a lot to say about the name change, a lot to say about the anti-discrimination resolution that needs to get passed, but we need to hear it from you. We need to put pressure on, on the Regents in particular. Um, any other questions? All right, I know the conversations will continue. I um, wanna draw your attention to a survey uh, that we'd like for you to take the time to fill out. This is for seeking faculty feedback. I know there's many of you online as well. So take a shot of that QR code. We need your feedback. This is one way to participate. You're gonna hear the word participate a lot from CPP. There's there's little p and big p, and we're going to talk about what that means. But for now, I'm going to say little p means participating together and getting involved. So um, we're going to hang out because we're all going to go to the social, right? In the ballroom, there's going to be the Asian Pacific Islander social as well as the LGBTQ social as well. So these conversations can continue. And thank you so much. Yeah.